Yo, what's up? What's up, y'all? It's your boy Jay Bling. Welcome to the Monster Moves Podcast. I got my family, my guy, Big Adam, Mr. Adam Plant. What's happening, bro? What it do, man? What it do? I'm in the building, man. I appreciate you having me on your show, bro. So we got a lot to talk about. You know, I, yes, I met sir. Big Adam. You know, he was doing security for uh, you know, Body Garden mm -hmm. for uh, Floyd Mayweather. And uh, right now, you know, he doing his thing, venturing off and, and becoming a, 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 a serial entrepreneur, doing his thing, family man. Yes, sir. It's just so much we're going we're gonna to touch on. And uh, starting off, how you doing? How you feeling, bro? Man, I'm doing good, man. Just a little... Uh Little, little, little tired, man. I've been moving around the Southland, man, delivering the, the world's greatest cheesecakes. But it's a pleasure. It's an honor. I'm glad. It's a blessing, man, to be able to get me and my wife's product out to the people and just to see the demand and the way we're making people react, man, with our cheesecakes. It's just it's a real blessing. First and foremost, we're mm -hmm. going to start off with talking about the cheesecake. Mm. And, and how did it come about? What made you start it? How did, you know, what made you guys say, this is what we're doing? Well, my wife always been able to make these cheesecakes since our kids were little. I was just so focused on uh, bodyguarding and wrapped up into who I was protecting at that time that I never let this actually flourish. And so um, it, it wasn't until 2019, I was on the road with uh, Saweetie and I had came home right before, um, Halloween and I had a friend that was a uh, casino host in uh, Las Vegas and she had you know hooked me up with a client so we were talking and she was telling me how much she liked cheesecake and I said what cheesecake I said my wife made the best cheesecake and she was like nah I said yeah and so she said okay have her make me one so my wife made her one and then I seen her about three days later and I said Jackie how'd you like the cheesecake she was like Adam oh my gosh let me tell you this I have never in my life taste anything like that how did how does your wife do that i said well you know it's her, it's her recipe and um you know uh i said oh, i told wow. you though it, it, it was fire and she was like adam you guys should make that a business i'm serious because i've never tasted nothing like that she said you guys everybody in my family went crazy over that so i went back home that night after i got through with the uh, security gig and i told my wife i said babe I, I i thought about everything i said i was talking to jackie and seeing how she reacted with the cheesecakes I said, babe, that's what we're going to do. So the next day, we went to our lawyer, and uh, we went and got our business license, our LLC, our tax ID, and uh, this was born, Tasty Tea Cheesecakes. What? Oh, that's yeah, crazy. Man. I never yeah. knew that. I always wonder. I was like, yo, because mm -hmm. I see you doing your thing. You're moving around with different clients and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. And then I just see. Cheesecake. Right. So I'm like, is he <laughs> is he promoting someone else's brand? Or what right. is it? And then I remember, you know, more videos and more content would come out. And mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh, it's his wife. Right. So, I, right. I, you know. So, yeah. So, Tasty Teas is my wife, Tamika. So, it's actually Tasty Tamika's Cheesecake. And we just shortened it out to Tasty Teas. You know what I mean? So I love that. My, I, I, I want to let everybody in the world know that I have nothing to do with making these cheesecakes. They are all made by my wife, the one and only Tamika Plant. Make sure you're following her. She's at Mrs. Tamika Plant on Instagram and uh, Facebook. And she is the queen sole creator of Tasty Teas Cheesecake. Now, my job is to get Tasty Teas to the people. So basically, we just took the best of our talents, you know, uh, with well, some of the best of our talents, which you know, she's an incredible baker. I mean, my wife can cook her ass off too. I mean, her, <laughs> but you know, we just decided to go to the cheesecake lane, but she's an incredible baker. And we just coupled that with my ability to get to the people. You know, I've always been a people person. And since I already had a big following from being a bodyguard for, from uh, Snoop Dogg and Mayweather and Shaq and uh, just a host of other big names, I took that crowd and said, well, if they follow me for the bodyguard thing, they're gonna definitely follow me for the food thing because one thing about food, is when it's great and all people like it, they're gonna love it, it's gonna be an instant hit. So that's, that's you know, that was- So your following is crazy because from, from your following from the security, mm -hmm. uh, I wanna touch on that also is right. for, how did you, what made you get into saying, you know, I'm gonna do this. This is what I'm gonna do from this point. When did you start, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, and saying, yo, 
full on, this is my, my career moving forward. As far as the security? Security, yeah. Okay, well, actually, I'm a football player, man. That's what I am. That's who, that's who I am to the, you know, to the day I die. I was an offensive tackle. And so, you know, um, I played, I started off playing at Long Beach City College, um, uh, you know, 95 champs. And then uh, from there, Long Beach. <laughs> I went to a Division II school called New Mexico Highlands out in Las Vegas, New Mexico. A lot of people don't know there was a Las Vegas. Las Vegas, New Mexico got its name. I mean, Las Vegas, Nevada got its name from Las Vegas, New Mexico. So wow. quick, quick little history. Uh, then from there, I uh, took three years off because um, me and my wife had our, our kids and stuff like that. And um, in 2001, I went to Tuskegee. I played one game for Tuskegee. I got homesick because I, you know, I was down in Alabama. I'm an L.A. cat and, you know, Great people in Alabama. I love the Southern hospitality and everything. And he treated me just, I mean, very, very good down there. But, you know, a, a city kid going to the backwoods, it's like, it was just a culture shock. And right. <laughs> you know, I, I should have hey, got It's crazy because I've been in Alabama. I'm like, I don't, go home. I don't like it here. <laughs> but shout out to Alabama, man. Some great people down there, man. But, you know, I, pl I played one game for uh, Tuskegee. Um, and um, I was like, man, nah, okay, I'm going to go back to the house. So, uh, just came back home, started training, got with an agent. He got me into a pro day. Um, and then in 2002, I got flown out to the uh, to camp with Kansas City Chiefs, did a workout for them for three, two days. And then on the third day, they um, you know, sat me down, told me I had everything physically, but they needed more film on me to be able to sign, actually sign me. So they sent, sent me to the uh, Canadian Football League. Mm -hmm. And then I signed with the BC Lions. I was playing right offensive tackle. And uh, right before my first preseason game in Canada, I uh, received an injury in practice, man. I got hit in the spine and had a contusion like like near my spinal cord. And it was just like, I could barely walk. So uh, in Canada, unfortunately, uh, they only can keep so many Americans and most of them are gonna be DBs and receivers. So me being the first offensive lineman that they had signed in like years uh, from America, uh, you know, I was a casualty of the cuts. So, you know, on the way back on the plane, I'm just, I'm like, damn, what am I going to do with my life? Because everything was focused on football. I had never, ever thought about being a security or anything else but a football player. And so um, I actually went back working to a, working at a grocery store. I was working at Ralph's uh, right behind Cal State Dominguez. And then I was, I had enrolled into Dominguez to, you know, just finish my, my uh, sociology degree and, just trying to figure out steps in life, where I was gonna go and you know, what was I gonna do? And I had a, a partner that came into uh, the store one day and he had a security shirt on. So I started laughing at him. I said, oh, look at this <laughs> fake ass police. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, yo, yo, nigga, fuck you. <laughs> and this dad, we know we go, we're going back and forth. And then he was like, hey man, but real shit, hey, I need the extra body, man, can you, can you work? I said, work what? He said, security. I said, man, I ain't no fake cop, dog. I don't do that shit. He was like, man, hey, this shit paying seventy dollars. I said, what for the week? He said, nah, for the night. And at that time, I was making like seven dollars and twenty five cent coming home from a football camp. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Man, yeah. So I'm like, seven twenty five an hour, seventy dollars. Seven twenty five, seventy. <laughs> I take the seventy. And I was like, damn, I can make seventy dollars for one night. I said, shit, sign me up. And so um, that was, I, you know, I did security at a comedy club, and it was for a comedian named Evan Lionel. Shout out to El. And I made seventy dollars on that on that Friday, and then seventy dollars on that Saturday. While I was there, um, the security manager, we you know we got to talking and everything, and so I had asked him. I said, "Hey man, how can I get more little gigs like this?" And then he was like, "Well, young man, you know you need, you need to get yourself known and just get out there and stuff like that." And so um, we we were staying at my mom's house in Compton on Santa Fe and Laurel, and um, every night for at that point. I had, a, I had a Ford Escort, man. It was a bucket, man. It was like one of the cars when you, you turn it on, that you had to leave that mud running for hours because you couldn't get it started again if you uh, try, try to turn it off. So every night I would drive from Compton to Hollywood, and then I would cruise uh, Sunset Boulevard and Hollywood Boulevard. Wherever I seen a crowd at, in a, you know, where, wherever it was a club setting, whatever, I would stop and see if I could meet the security supervisor and see if I can get on for that night. So I did that until I eventually got seven nights, seven day, nights a week work. And um, wow, yeah, man, networking. I got, I got it, got it from the mud, man. How like, did you know this? Like, I'm stopping here. I'm gonna stop there. How did you know? Well, you know what, man? Luckily, one of the things that football taught me, 
And one of the things that I had as, as a kid is the ability to see something and figure it out real quick. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, football gave me that, that ability to think quick and then just add it to who I was as a person. I was, you know, when I would see things visually, I kind of knew how to just put it together real, real quick to fit whatever I was trying to do. And so being in that I was trying to find clubs to work at, you know, it just was common sense. You know, you see a big crowd, there, might be, there must be a popular spot, so stop and see if you can, you know, nav- navigate your way through there. And, and luckily I did, man. I did that, I did that every night. So, 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 you're, so you're doing that every night. Mm-hmm. Who, was your, who was your first big client? Because I know in Hollywood, you're going to meet somebody. So yes, who was sir. the first person you was like, yo? So, okay, so do, doing the club, so, so in the security world, man, you got like different phases of security. You got, you know, club security. You got those who become bodyguards but can only be with rappers. You got some guys who can only do athletes. And then you got some guys who become like professional bodyguard who can, you know, handle the uh, executives. So we call that executive protection. So for me, starting off in the club, I'm glad I did that because it gave me that ability to be able to do crowd control and, and work with a, a, a big amount of people. And, you know, with security, you have to have your people skills together. But I think uh, a lot of guys who have gotten to that industry where they mess up is they just try to jump in and be the top dog without getting their feet wet. And, you know, you got to get your feet wet by. For me, if I I had a school of security, I would want all my guys to work in a club first so they can get used to being around a bunch of people and they can know how to, you know, manage the crowd, how to maneuver their bodies into – you know, making people move a certain way when we need to get right. people moving. You right. know what I mean? So, so um, smart, smart. yeah, man. And so doing doing that, you know, and, I, and I've always been observant too. You know, I just I just I, I try to think quick. I try to observe things quick and make a uh, make quick decisions so that I can be as professional as I can. I try to do that with every point. You know, every phase of my life. So um, when I was in the in the, in the uh, clubs. I would notice guys coming in with bodyguards. And so at that point I was like, man, this, this is not what I wanted to do, but since I'm in it, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna be one of the best that ever did this shit. So when I would uh, notice the guys coming in with, with the uh, bodyguards, I just wouldn't see how the guys would move and different things like that. And I say, okay, that's what I need to do right there. If I'm, if I'm gonna do security, I need to be at the top. So. I said, I'm going to be a bodyguard. So the first person I actually bodyguarded for was uh, Ricky Davis, NBA player, uh, former NBA player. And he was playing for the, uh, I think, the Clippers at that time. And um, uh, I basically just walked up to him in the, in the club bar fly. Uh, that was the spot in Hollywood. I used to sneak in bar fly. <laughs> I used to DJ Monday night. sneak in. Monday yeah, nights. Monday nights. Yeah, on man. sunset, right? Yep, so yep. a little by the little hotel on the side. Yes, I used to sneak right to yes, the back sir. door and just it's the tower network. Network. The street. network. Yep. You know, with the, with the, the tower uh, with, with the, the yellow sign. Yellow sign. <laughs> so sneaking in. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, that's crazy. Yeah, so uh the Monday night spot, it was a uh, uh bar fly. And uh like I said, you know, uh, Ricky Davis, he, he was at the counter with him and a couple of other NBA cats. And I just walked over there, I was like, Hey Rick, what's up, man? I said, Hey. If you ever need security, man, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm your dude, man. You know what I mean? I, I didn't really, I, I hadn't bodyguarded nobody before, but I was like, shit, I'm gonna give it a shot. And uh, being that, you know, we were the same height, we both six, seven, he was like, all right, yeah, man, you a big dude too. I, I need that, I need somebody big around me who can, you know, yeah, you know, Rick was a star at that at that time. And so uh, he would, Rick would give me like, like two, 300 uh, every time I went out with him. And then I would, you know, like I say, going from <laughs> 725 hour at the store, to seventy dollars now, you talking about two or three hundred? I'm like shit, <laughs> right? I don't make two or three hundred. What? And so I said, man, definitely. This, this, that's what I'm gonna do, man. So from Rick, I went to um, Ricky had a, a, another dude who was a uh, former police officer who was like his main guy, and um, uh, that dude had plugged me up with a uh, Blue Cantrell. So Blue Cantrell, I got with her. He put me on a gig with her going over to London. And uh, she was performing for uh, something called the Princess Trust, I think for Prince Harry or one of them, one of them uh, princes over there. And um, wow. that was my first time going overseas or going to London. And so, you know, Blue was, she was an incredible artist, man, and just a, a really good lady to know. And um, she had, a, she had a, a boyfriend named Tony De Niro 
at the time. I think Tony Tony was in the music and doing some. I remember him. Yeah, Tony was a good dude too. So, funny story is, uh, I was working at Club Vinyl one time, and I had a, a little partner. He was a little 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 beat dog homeboy. Uh, you know, uh, over the over two years in Hollywood, you know, you would hear everything in the club. Like, man, this one signing with. Death Row, this, this dude gonna be on this, this dude is gonna be that. So Facts. I had heard all kind of stories and shit like that, but with me, if you my homie, you my homie, right? So I was working at Club Vinyl, and uh, my boy came up, he was like, big guy, he said, hey man, let me and, home, and the, me and the homies in the um, VIP. He said, hey, my nigga about to sign with Death Row. Not, not Death Row, uh, uh, he about to sign with Dr. Dre. And I didn't know who the dude was at the time, and shit, so I was like, Man, you ain't got to tell me no stories, man. You know, you know how I mean? I'm just let y'all in just because it's, it's all good. So, you know, I, I ain't really pay attention to the dude, so I let him in. So, um, fast forward when I got with Blue Can Trail, uh, we were over in London, and so Tony De Niro hands me a CD. He's like, "Hey, man, you heard of this kid from Compton? They call him Game." I said, "Nah, I ain't heard. I ain't heard of him." He said, "Man, he is cold, dog." He's like, "Look," and he gave me the CD, and I looked on the back of it. I was like. Man, I said, ain't this a bitch? I said, this the dude that I got in the VIP. I right, said, man, my right. boy, wasn't, he wouldn't be with mine and shit. I said, damn. He's like, oh, man, listen to him. And so, you know, I, I put it in and shit. And, and uh, uh, game, game had a lyric, man. Uh, he said, when I'm, when I'm in MIA, I'm in, I'm in some, when I'm in MIA, I'm in a Jamaican mood. Niggas mess with me all day. I eat you like Jamaican food or some shit like that. Right. But he was rapping over that uh, CeeLo beat to uh, Call Me. That boom. Dun, 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 boom, 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 boom. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, he said, when I'm in MIA, I'm steady making moves. Any beef with G-Unit niggas that eat you like Jamaican food. Right. I was like, damn. Okay. So I listened to the whole thing. And I said, okay, that kid, that kid is nice. Yeah, and so. Um, it's crazy. You know, it's crazy with game, right? Mm. You set up a track. For me, me and Game to work with. Remember, which one? Gone, it's it's called I'ma Need That, right? Like oh, like in 2014. Yeah, 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 so man. So shout yeah, out to you yeah, for doing yeah, that linking yeah. with Game. It's crazy. Yeah, me and his mom, his mom, me and his mom got a close relationship. I me coming up. I, okay. I used to do clubs in right. Lancaster. She used to do like comedy clubs in Lancaster and mm -hmm. stuff too. So we ended up developing a relationship, and and then it's crazy. Mm. You connected me with Game. That's why. Right. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that, that's funny, man. I had forgot all about that, man. That's I think that's the time he had came to uh to the champs gym, mm -hmm. right? And I had to lace y'all up. Yep, yeah, yep. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's funny, man. But yeah, when so when you know I seen that 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 CD, man. I, I seen dude right, right there. It let me know, you know, don't just always assume that every story is gonna be the same from people telling you stuff in the club. You never know who's who, and so. Uh, I had seen game at a few other uh, venues and stuff like that, and we had got you know cool and so because he had recognized me from the club and stuff, and um, uh, I had seen him one t one particular time we were at the uh, Lakewood Twenty Four Hour Fitness, and then uh, we you know using there working out, and he was like, "Hey, big guy," he's like, "Hey, man, you you, you heard I got I got signed with uh, Dre." I said, "Yeah, man, the little homie was telling me that," but I said, "Yeah," he's like, "Look." He said, when I when I um I'm gonna go meet with Jimmy Iovine and stuff and and, and Dre and everybody and I'm I want you to come to the meeting because I want to put you on as my security. And I'm like, man, you serious? He's like, hell yeah, I got you. I said, cool. And um, you know, everything you were saying was right, man. He, he um he he sent me the date that we were supposed to go up there and meet. I went to Interscope and I walk in, man. It's Jimmy Iovine. is uh, I, I man, every everybody from Game Camera. I'm like, damn, this really this shit is real, really happening. And so I had actually also called one of my boys, uh, Larry. Larry, I think Larry was working with Boys to Men at the time. And um, I was like, hey, man, just come. I want you to come to this meeting with me because if I need an extra dude, I'm going I'm to I'm uh, you know, put you on with me. And so, um, yeah, man, I was actually my first, you know, big, big artist was, uh, was Game. Wow. And so wow. I worked the uh, video shoot with him in 50. That This is how we do video shooting. That, that we were filming that on Sunset. And um, you know, while while we were at the shoot, the shoot, um, you know, you know, by it being that game was like at that time when he came out, he was like the biggest blood rapper, you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, outside of DJ Quick and Mac Ten. Right. You know, he was the he was the new guy, he was fresh, and then he was just cold, you know what I'm saying? So all the B dogs like, okay, this is this I do, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Cause uh, you know, he had so many 
so many Crip cats coming out. But now you got the, you got the B dog, but he hard though because a lot of dudes thought Game was from New York when he first when they first heard him. Yeah, that back. swag because yeah. he had that 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 flow. You know what I mean? Right, right. And so um, we were at the video shoot, man, and uh, it was just the 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 environment, man, was like so many dudes there, and I, just looking at it, I was like, man, I, I could see that this shit might get real hectic. You know what I mean? And and me working. Uh, in the clubs for two years prior to that, dealing with all kind of gang shit and this, that, and the third, and just being raised in that, man, I was like, man, I kind of want something that, you know, uh, uh, I think it's going to be a little smoother, <laughs> you know what I mean, right. as far as who I'm, who I'm going to be permanently bodyguarding and stuff like that. But um, so shortly after that video shoot, uh, the head of security for um, for Snoop, I, I, was, I had talked to him um, – and you know we we were talking about me working for Snoop, but he was like, man, you know, I'm I'm eventually, you know, I'll eventually put you on. And it was funny because I was also playing on Snoop Dogg's football team at the time, uh, so I yeah. was working club security, doing like little spot dates with game. And then Snoop had a semi pro team on that I was that I was playing for. So um, how how uh, I got with Snoop, I actually had took a job at the uh, uh, a club called. Uh, Body English in, in Vegas. It was like the, the brand new hot spot at the Hard Rock Hotel, which yep. is now the Virgin Hotel. I took a position there as a club security, and Snoop had just came out with uh, Drop It Like It's Hot, so he was coming there to perform. And as soon as he get off the bus, they you know they hit the corner and they see me there, and everybody was like, "Hey, Big Adam, what you doing up here?" And I was like, "I work up here." And so the head of security was like, uh, "His name is Papa. Shout out to Papa." He was like, "Hey." Um, Big Adam, you be, you be uh, coming up to Vegas like that? I said, yeah. He said, you, don't you live in Long Beach? I said, yeah. I said, I drive up on the weekends and work. He was like, hey, man, come see me Monday, man. I'm going I'm, to I'm put you on. So, uh, wow. <laughs> you know, that, that I, I remember that night like it was yesterday, man. So um, it was cool because, you know, dog had, dog had killed the club that night, man. He had all the all the NFL dudes there because I think it was in the spring sometimes. So everybody was off season. So, Club was just packed. Paris Hilton was that's when she was the hottest thing going. And and uh man, as soon as he did drop it like it's hot, the club just went crazy. And uh that was a I, super smash. Yeah, I was just on the vibe that night, like thinking, damn, okay, Monday. This I'm this one be starting working with the cool. And just to know that, you know, financially I'll be in a better spot because I'm gonna have a, a daily gig with, with Snoop. And so uh that Monday, the August seventh, uh, I'll never forget that stuff. Uh well, I thought it was spring. It was August, early August, August seventh, um, two thousand four. That's when I became full time Snoop Dogg. Wow! So, yeah, man. Wow! Wow! So, mm -hmm. so, 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 rolling with Snoop, you moving around with Snoop. How was that? Because you, because you, because you know, you said game. It, it got a little rowdy, but with Snoop, <laughs> it was a little rowdy too. Bro. Yeah, man. But you, I mean, I'll say it like this, man. Um, I just, I, I felt a little more comfortable and knowing like I had played on Snoop's football team so I got to know everybody around him you know a little bit better now personally like me knowing game me and knowing Snoop I had I love for both of them brothers man to this day and it, you know the, it was it was it was love from on the, on the one-on-one but just looking at the two camps at the time it, you know game being being the new on, on, on the new kid on the scene and shit like that I knew that a lot of dudes around him was just gonna be doing a lot of foolish shit because, you know, he was the breakout guy. You know, what right, 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 Snoop right. was more established in the game already, so his um, entourage it and was people very were, much more commercialized than the streets. Side yeah, of yeah. I mean, you know, Snoop, Snoop, you know, y'all, he, 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 he is who he is. You know, what right, I'm saying? Right. so it's, like, it's it's always some hood shit, but it, I say it was more structured. Right. Okay. It was a more structured um, camp. Got it. Uh, games camp at the con at the time was a little more, not not I ain't gonna say bad, but it was just it was more youngsters around, more uh, knuckleheadish, more knucklehead shit that could have happened. Right, you know what I'm right. saying. Although you know, being <laughs> work was stupid, I had gotten to some gotten to some shit, but it just was not as common a thing that I thought would happen with Snoop as I did with you know uh, looking at working with Game. It's crazy because I I remember. Uh, <laughs> When I first got my glimpse of, mm. of Big Adam, it was through the press of London, <laughs> of you and Snoop in London and, and Snoop yeah, going man. crazy. 
yeah. and wilding and and, and, and and I remember on that was this the same tour when Snoop was mad that the chicken was bland or something like that? Might have been because you know it, it, with dog man, if you had any any a little minor thing wrong and you know how he wanted his shit and you didn't make it, you make it right. Uh, he would go off on you, man. I yeah. just need some chicken, some some, some seasoning <laughs> on my shit, man. Shit yeah. bland out here. Yeah, he he would go off on things like that, man. So, um, but yeah, man, that that particular incident that was in London Heathrow, man, and um, we were going over to Africa, and London was the layover, and so in the airport they had the little lounge where you know you can relax while you know you're on your uh, layover and so london heathrow at that time was i mean it was so big it looked like a mall so snoop wanted to walk around and you know do whatever so as we were walking around i guess the band members were making some noise or whatever and the people that worked there started complaining and called the police in there so when we returned with snoop they got at us and him like he was the one and so, you know, dog, like, hey, hey, cuz, nigga, I, I'm Snoop Dogg. That, 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 just that, and the third. And so, an uh, argument ensued. Shit got, you know, hectic. So, as we're walking to go get on the plane, I guess uh, the police had told the uh, gate people, don't let us on the plane. And so, we seen that happen. So, Snoop, you know, as we're walking, he's telling his manager, walk up there. They're they about to try to hate on us so we can't get on the British Airways. And so they kicked us off that flight. So we, uh, he, just, the manager was like, "Let's go get on Virgin Atlantic." So we turned around, walking over to Virgin Atlantic, and then the, the police kept pressing their issue. Snoop kept pressing his issue. And, you know, he wasn't going back down. And so it got to a point where it just, uh, just you know, all hell broke loose. Man, one of the one of the cops, I guess, was trying to get him to stop. So kind of reached out to push Snoop. <laughs> And uh, one of the other dudes that was working with me, I, I ain't going to say his name, but not 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 church, but it, it was me and three other big dudes. They all was a little taller and bigger than me. Uh, when the when the cop reached out and touched Snoop, <laughs> he was like, "Don't touch him!" and pushed the shit out. That, that cop <laughs> fell into like two other cops, and man, all them dudes took their sticks out and. At the at that time, the batons were called asp, and the asps are like smaller batons that you you could just flick open. Right. And at the end of them, it gets a, it's a little um, like ball. ball. Right? And if that ball hits you right on the bone or something, it, it will break your shit. You know what I mean? So all of them just flick their asp open and just start welling our asses to death, man. And uh, dog, when I say I felt like goddamn uh, uh, <laughs> Kunta stuff. Kente and uh, with Toby and Roots. I'm like, gosh, damn. So they hit it, man, they was whooping our ass, man. And uh if you if anybody go and watch that video, just type in uh Snoop Dogg and London Heathrow at the toward the end of the video when they push us all into the uh um, the, right? the duty free store, you yeah. all the glass breaking and shit, you go hear a girl screaming, Y'all killing her, y'all gonna kill her, y'all kill her. And she's screaming like at the top of her lungs, and that's the homegirl Tasha. She was referring to me. Cause the, one of the cops had uh, put the stick under my neck, what? and so he was pulling it up. And two of the other cops was on each shoulder, one on this shoulder, one on this shoulder. They were trying to push me down as he's pulling up. So I was like, ah, ah, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And then um, you know she seen that, started screaming. And then uh, Snoop was like, hey, hey, God, y'all gonna kill my nigga? <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself. Man, if you would have just walked to the motherfucking plane, man, we wouldn't be getting our ass whooped right there, man. But you know, when you a bodyguard, man, you gotta uh, come with, come with, it come with the territory, man. And uh, you know, I bet, I, you know, I, I, I got love so much love for Snoop, man, because he took me around the world with him, man. So you know, at, at, I'm, I'm always in appreciation mode with him because he showed, you know, because of him, I was able to see a lot of stuff in life that. I, even if I had been playing in the NFL, I still wouldn't have went to the, the place I went to with him. Right. And everywhere I went with Snoop, you know, we got the um, we got the best treatment. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I've been to Australia, I've been all over North America, South America, Africa, Asia, Europe. Only continent I ain't touched with Snoop is Antarctica. Antarctica. Real, Antarctica. <laughs> real talk. Right, you know what right. I'm saying? Yeah. Hold up. 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 I ain't slowing down, let me give you that. So, um, move, moving from Snoop, mm -hmm. 
Champ was next, right, Floyd? Yeah. So, so how'd you get with Floyd? So um, I was actually at work with Snoop and um, uh, Big Church had had me. Now, um, Big Church, I had got him his job with Dog. And um, in 2007, you know, Snoop had a little situation in court where he just had to get rid of like the bulk of security, and I was the only one who he had kept. And so, um, you know, uh, Big Church being from Vegas, he had, you know, went back to Vegas and Floyd had picked him up. And so it was around uh, late December, he had hit me and said, Hey, man, Floyd is getting rid of one of his dudes. If I can get you over here, would you want to work? And it, just me wanting to change the pace at the time. I was like, yeah, hell yeah. So Floyd was coming down to playing a celebrity game uh, with um, the Watt team Watson. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was like December 14th or something like that. So I asked one of the dudes to cover me and I was going, I went over to the uh, Van Nuys airport and met him. And so, you know, uh, Church had already told him about me, Big Mark, rest in peace, had told him about me. And so what, uh, when I met him at the airport, he got off the plane, he looked me up and down, was like, Big Church, you good? He's like, the church like, hell yeah. And he's like, Big Mark, he good? He's like, hell yeah. He's like, all right, we got, he, he on. <laughs> yeah. So That's I started fine. I started with uh Mayweather uh December 28th, 2007. Mm. So um going from one iconic guy in Snoop to the next iconic guy in Floyd, you know, it was it was an easy transition for me, uh, security wise, because I had already being, you know, being groomed and learned different techniques and uh, put my security stamp on the game being, with the years I had with Snoop. So going into working with Floyd, it was going to be more of the same. It's just the only difference was I was going from a uh, world-renowned MC to a world-renowned boxer. So just the setting changed. Right. But uh, all the, the, the skill sets still remained the same. You know, I was going to go there and do my, do my job and do what I do. And uh, represent Adam Plant. You know so, I mean? so how long were you at Floyd? Floyd off and on for ten years. Uh, Snoop off and on for uh, seven years. And um, um, you know with Floyd, man, we just we had. I mean, you know the story. Right. <laughs> a lot, a lot of ups and downs, man. You know, um, Floyd, one of the greatest boxers of all time, undoubtedly. Nobody can ever deny that. And um, to see how dude trained and and horned in on his craft, man, was incredible. But outside of that, you know, we just, we, we had our clashes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some some days were good, but majority of them was not what it, what it could have been, what it should have been. But it was all a learning experience, you know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. all, everything, everything that happened in a person's life, you learn from it, whether it's good or bad, and then you take that and just keep building your character and keep, um, you know, adding to your life toolbox of things that you're going to use to do or don't do to make better moves in the future. So, I, you know, I'm very, to, to, to Floyd too, I'm very thankful for all the things that I was able to be a part of, the, the um, you know, the Pacquiao fight, the, uh, the uh, Canelo fight, the, the um, the uh, Conor McGregor fight and just all the things that came in the world of him being who he was as a bo who he is right. as a boxer and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, uh, I, I took that and, you know, uh, while I was with Floyd, you know, my social media experience, you know, blossomed and stuff like right. that. So, I took a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, fanfare I got from being a bodyguard came with Floyd because you know Instagram went out when I was with Snoop. So when I got with Floyd, that's when I finally got on Instagram, social media, and stuff like that. So that's how I kind of built my brand even more, being with him. So you know 2017, I mean? you pretty much you you break off of Floyd, mm. and you doing your and you're picking up more celebrity clients or just more like whales. Those you know. Those well, so whales. so the, the the thing that I always knew about Las Vegas, and this was even when I was working with Snoop, uh, it was a couple of times where uh, I I would put other guys on. If, if Snoop was going out of town or something like that, and I would shoot to Vegas, and uh, because uh, when I had, when, you know, prior to me becoming a bodyguard, uh, when I was meeting people, when I was working at Club Body English, you know, I that's when I started seeing what security could really make in this game in Las Vegas, 
And so I already knew that as I continued to do security, I was going to be picking up get more gamblers and, and guys who would pay the money that I wanted to get paid. So uh, fast forward to 2017 when I was decided to just walk away from uh, working for Floyd from, for good, I already had a number of big paying clients, gamblers that I knew that, you know, I was going to roll with. So, uh, and, and, you know, I, I still knew I was going to, you know, have a couple of celebrity clients, whatever, if, if, it, if it came to that point. But my whole thing. Yeah, because you're. Like, I look at you like a celebrity bodyguard. Like you're yeah. like if, if if someone hires you, it's like they made right. it as a as entertainment. Like right. oh, I got Big Adam. Yeah, right. I made it. Now I'm official. You yeah, got I'm Big official. Adam. Huh? Yeah, that's that, true. and that's that's real talk. Because you because yep. you one you got the experience, mm-hmm. and 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 if you know you walk somebody's walking with you, it's like okay, he's the real of the real top right. of the top. Right. This ain't no beginner stuff. Mm-hmm. You know. People who was worth millions and millions of dollars trust mm-hmm. you right. to, you know, protect their life right. in an atmosphere of thousands of people. So it's yeah. like, you know, it's like a celebrity feel. Like you mm-hmm. know, you, you made it. So I, I know a lot of celebrities had to just be like, oh now, oh you know, Floyd, yeah. I, I, that's my chance. Because yeah, well, I mean that that's in the security game. That's how it actually works, Ben. Where when one person sees you with a uh, Snoop Dogg and a Floyd Mayweather, they know. Well, I know the status of those two men. So if they trust him, I got to trust him. You know Facts. what I mean? And so that's what um, pretty much led to me working with Shaq. Because Shaq has seen me with Snoop over the years. Then he seen me with Floyd over Shaq. the years. And then, you know, boom. When he found out I wasn't with, uh, you know, working with Floyd anymore, he was like, oh, okay. And, um, you know, me, me and Shaq had more of the uh, brother you know, relationship, man. We know we bagging on each other and shit, wrestling, and just we had more similar ways. Like, although me and Snoop always had that 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 brotherly camaraderie and stuff too, and and me and Floyd here and there, but but Shaq, man, we both were like jokesters and shit like that. So, um, working with him, man, was um, it was it was a, a pleasure, man, because we, like I said, we we would joke around a lot of stuff, and uh, you know, um, that was going from once again an MC to a boxer to now. NBA, so yeah. it's like I went from icon to icon to icon, you know what I mean? And I, and I just really, when I look at that, and I often post that on my Instagram, and and people sometimes I'd be like, damn man, he posting that again, he posting that again, because I be wanting people to realize in the celeb- in the, in the in the bodyguard industry, if a man gets one big client in his whole career, he's done a lot. You know what I'm saying? If you get one. Right. To ha- to to get three, you know what I mean? These are smooth and, ha- and have shakers. To to to, get, I mean, people got to realize. Look who I had, Snoop Dogg. At one time, I was the head of his security. At one time, Floyd Mayweather. At one time, I was the head of his security. Then she, then Shaquille O'Neal. So I got three Hall of Fame icons that will be remembered for life. You know what I mean? Right. To to be able to step in that position where. These men trusted me. Like at one time, I had all these dudes' cell number in my phone. You know what I mean? I I I know their families. They this, that, and the third. You know what I'm saying? And they know they can always trust me because nothing in their personal lives and their family lives have they ever heard come back to them like, "Hey, man, big Adam going around saying this or doing this or that." Nah, you ain't gonna get that. No matter right. if I get mad at them or they was mad at me or you know we don't speak for years or whatever it is, I, they still never heard anything that would lead them to say they couldn't this trust me. This is very true. Very you know what I mean? Very and um, uh, that, that's, just, that's just a credit to who I am as a man. You know, I just, no matter what I go through with clients, I'll never put myself in a position to tell their business or anything like that or put myself in a position where they know they couldn't trust me with anything. Right. To this day, you know, I still got that, that 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 respect from those those guys because they know that you know right. they never had so, no so the drive of 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 you know working so much being gone mm-hmm. pretty much all year because you know what I'm saying right. and the driving force was I remember you were always say my kids my kids my yeah. kids yeah. so so how was it like being on the road mm-hmm. and and being gone so long. But then at the same time, your kids, from what I've seen on your Instagram, they're so successful at a yeah. young age. It's like, how did how how did that? Uh, credit to my wife. Uh, you know, it, it takes in in this industry, 
if you are a parent as well as a bodyguard, you have to have, a man has to have a strong wife. He has to have a, a wife who can deal with the fact that he's going to be gone a lot and then deal with the fact that, you know, she's going to have to be able to hold the house down. You know, the thing with, with us that do, do this type of work, we're put in a position where we can make the money that we can take care of our families. But the flip side of being able to make good money is always time that you're going to have to give up on something else. And so the, the, the fine balance for me was that every time I was, I was home, I made sure that I was, you know, making the most of our family time. So we were always going out doing things and, um, just being at as much stuff as I could with my kids as possible. Now I missed a lot of stuff cause you know, like you said, I was on the road, but, um, <clears throat> thank God, you know, the FaceTime came out. So, you know, you oh, see, man. Yeah, <laughs> that, that right. was like a lifesaver right there. So you can see a lot of stuff when you was, wasn't there, but, um, constantly, you know, always calling my, my, my wife, and my kids every day, even like overseas and stuff like that. And it, it, it's, it's days where it's hard, man, because, uh, like I remember Snoop being on tour, we were over in Europe, we were gone for like 50 days, you know what I mean? And, uh, um, some some days, man, they were just like, damn, man, I'm really missing my family, you know. And then, uh, you know, you may, you're making money, but it's it, nothing replaces time, right? And that's that's what we got to realize, man. Nothing replaces time. So, uh, when you, it's it's an, un, an understandable thing as an adult when you have a family, you have to do what you have to do to take care of that family. I understand, but uh, I would tell all men who are in this industry. Make time for your woman and your kids, man. You you have to do that, and be the best father that you can be. Right. You know, you, if you know you're gone, make sure that when you come back, you know you 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 have a good place for your kids. You know, your woman got a vehicle, and just things are taken care of in the home. You know, there's no worry about food or clothes or uh, uh, school. Like all three of my kids went to Bishop Gorman High School. In one of the yeah, most prestigious yeah, schools yeah, in Las Vegas, yeah, put all three. It's expensive too. <laughs> yeah, it's expensive, but I, I remember you. You know, it's crazy. I mm. remember you. You driving leave from we was on tour of Floyd, mm. moving around, and you went back home and you drove like I think to like North Carolina. Or uh, uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. Drove my son. Virginia. Yeah, to a football camp, man. Wow. Yeah, from Las Vegas. I drove him. Took forty nine hours to make that drive, man. And uh, but it's just I, I'm just that type of father, man. And uh, um, you know. I, me playing football, and then my son was way better than me at that age uh, playing. I wanted to give him every opportunity to become everything he wanted to become in that field. And it was the same thing with my girls, you know, everything that they wanted to become. My Luckily, like I said, I mentioned, my wife is just a hell of a woman, and she she uh, was able to put all that love and care and education into the kids as I was on the road. So that was the job within itself. So my job as a man is just, you know, always provide that financial security and make sure that they was always in a, in a great home and had just had everything that they need. So I know that even when I'm gone, that they're taken care of, right. you know, to the, to the, to the best of my ability. But to answer that question, a, a man got to have a strong ass woman. If you, if you're going to be in this game, right. <laughs> wives you got to be strong because you got man. some women that like pick me or the world on a job <laughs> now this is this is the the thing that dudes do wrong they get so caught up into who they're bodyguarding that they forget their family man, you know man i didn't see this shit, so. man you and me uh seen it a million times you get caught up into who you bodyguarding and that's your world rather than you know, I'm gonna do my job for this person, but I'm going to take care of my family, and my family's my world. So you gotta separate the two, man. You can't you can't be in love with your client and, 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 and <laughs> put your family on the side. You can't do that. Now, has any clients got mad that you took care of your family first instead of them? Yep. What? <laughs> so how did you handle that? I'm never gonna change being who the fuck I am. You know what I'm saying? I'm Adam Plant. And family comes first, and if you can't deal with it, then shit. I, I won't be there, point blank. And, you know, I've had to go through them situations where, you know, I was, I was put on timeouts and, uh, suppose, you told supposedly your family? for, you know, pe people I was working for because I told my family. And uh, I've even been told, you know, it's going to be either your, your family or you're going to choose me, which you're going to choose. I've been told that by a client. And luckily, I chose my family 
at mm-hmm. all times, anytime. No nothing coming in my life is God, me and my family. That's it. And nothing comes before that. And I, you know, luckily with me being with Snoop first, Snoop was a family man himself. So he he totally understood any time that I had to have a day off or this, that, and the third, you know, he under he understood and I never had that problem with him. So and being that I had went around the world with him, anybody else I worked with after him. It was like I already been there, done that. So ain't nothing you can do to say to me and show me to impress me with anything. I've been around the world, with Snoop Dogg. What the, what the fuck can you show me? Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? So exactly. So I just had I had my my circumstance in um, how I came up in the security game was very unique, you know. And uh, but it was it was to my benefit that it allowed me to uh, really pick and choose who I wanted to. To, to work for and how I wanted to, to guide my career. And uh, so now, now we're going on after after Shaq, everybody, you know, know I got it with uh, 6 9 Oh, yeah, <laughs> I forgot so about 6, six and nine. 9 So it's like you go from whoop to whoop to whoop to But, oh, well, okay, let me, let me rewind it. Game 6 9 like, yo, well, that's rowdy. Well, let me, let me rewind it. So I'm missing one critical person. So it, before a game, so it was Ricky Davis, Blue Cantrell, then Cat Williams. A lot of you don't know that I was, I was Cat Williams bodyguard for a total of like all the times I was that 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 I was with him and then not with him and then with him again. Uh, I probably about about two years, about two years with uh with 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 Cat. With Cat. Um, and let me say this <laughs> uh, about let's see, was that 2018? We was what? down. We was down Cat at, Williams. I was down in Atlanta with him, and uh, you know he had a little situation when he got into it with uh, uh, the lady who worked it on the radio, Wanda or some some Wanda whatever. Sykes, not not Wanda Sykes, uh, yeah. some lady that was she's a big radio personality in Atlanta. So her and Cat did her show one morning, and they you know they started going back and forth with words. And um, later on that night, we had a little issue with her husband showed up at the club, act like he was security, and as we're coming up to the door. Uh, he he said yelled out the cat. Oh oh, you feeling yourself tonight? And cat was like, nigga, fuck you, nigga. And <laughs> so, so <laughs> all true story. So dude pull out the Desert Eagle, right? So mind you, I can carry, I can carry in, the, in Georgia too. But I, uh, cat had told me to leave my gun in the car. He's like, no, we're going to the company club. We had parked in the back of the um, of the shopping center. He was like, no, no, you don't have to bring a gun. We we should be cool. So. Uh, uh, you know, the words was exchanged, and dude pulled out a Desert Eagle, man, and did just he put that motherfucker to my face, dog, and was like, "Back up, nigga! He don't pay you enough." And with me, I pride myself in saying that I have never ran from a gun, never ran from a knife, never ran from shit as a bodyguard, never. And can nobody say that? Adam Plant punked out of anything. You know what I'm saying? My resume is was is well deserved because I ain't never been a motherfucking punk and I always stood my ground and I always handled my business. And, it, and whenever it was time to get active, if it had to go there, it, it went there. And I, and I got active. But the thing is, uh, at the same time, you don't want to lose your life behind this shit. But I mean, oh, yeah. there's a lot of shit that come, come with being a bodyguard, man. So... Dude pulled that Desert Eagle, man, to my face. And I was just like, damn, I'm going to go out like this? And, you know, I ain't beg for my life or no shit. I just was like, hey, homie, chill, chill. And then, uh, uh, you know, Cat Hat took off. And then, you know, we we, we finally he got ran, everything. He, <laughs> like he, he left you there? Like, what? This is, on, this is on YouTube, man. So, you know, ain't, ain't uh, one thing that's beautiful about so, me. Cat Williams it, left. Anything I tell people, you can go look that shit up on YouTube and see for yourself. I ain't got to. I ain't got to uh, so make how, no how did shit that up. Conversation when I, go when you got back to Cat Williams, like nigga, you so, left me, nigga. Well, I mean, you know, I understand. Some if if somebody got a gun on you, man, I can't. I can't say that if you run, you a punk or you scared. Cause I mean, shit, you don't want to fucking die. So right, I mean, I'm right, a realist. Right. This is dude. This is true. This <laughs> you is know what I'm saying? I just didn't run, so I mean, I didn't. I, I don't, I, at the same time, I didn't want to get shot. <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? So I was like, "Oh, we chill, like nigga, don't please don't shoot me." <laughs> but I didn't say that. I was just like, "Homie, chill." But uh, luckily, you know, thank God, I didn't, I didn't get my head blown off. And uh, when I finally went in the store, <laughs> it got that red to the back, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the cops came and they, they asked, 
<laughs> they asked did I want to press charges. And so he looked at me like, nigga, you going to press charges? And I'm like, nah. And he's like, you ain't gonna press charges. And, 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 and I'm like, no, nah, man. Because one of the things, man, that's <laughs> that's kind of fucked up in the bodyguard industry is that, especially if you grew up in the, in the streets, man. You know, <laughs> that's how he said it. You, you ain't gonna press charges. <laughs> like Donna, man, now eleven thirty. Pimping the strength. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, he looked at me like that. Like, you ain't gonna press charges. I'm like, nah, man, because you know how we're always taught don't snitch, this, and that, and the third. You know, keep shit, it, it, you know, if it's something going on in your neighborhood, keep it in your neighborhood. Don't go to the man with it and all that. You, you, you grow up on these kind of mind uh, tactics and, and what you've been taught. In, in uh you know where, where you was raised at man and so it kind of um flows over to the bodyguard world where it's like an unwritten rule that you won't speak on certain things and you don't press charges on sh on people for shit mm -hmm. you know what I mean you just you, you take it because that's that's part of the job mm -hmm. so me as a man that you know um consciously analyzes stuff, I understood, yeah, this this is that was that dude's wife. He got Maggie's cat and her got into it. So he he's coming to his wife's defense. Now, the pulling the gun on me part, I'm just glad that I didn't have my shit on me because as soon as I, I you know, I'm very instinctive. I can see shit before it happens. If I look 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 at a person and it looked like they going for some shit, I'm I'd have had my shit out and blazed him up. You right. know what I mean? I, right. I, I shot dude, man, and and at the end of the day, I probably still been sitting in jail, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, no, nah, because I have I have a uh, license, but I'd have had that on on my conscience that I killed a dude, man. you know what I'm saying, over a comedian, right? You know what I mean? And it's like fuck, man, come on, man. And that's the thing with with bodyguarding, it's like you can get put into situations that somebody's life could be taken over some bullshit, and they want the bodyguard might have had to do it to save your client, but you in, in your mind you might have been you might be thinking, my client was wrong. This motherfucker caused this whole shit. And if he wouldn't have did this, this shit wouldn't have happened. But now I took somebody's life. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of shit that you gotta think about. Uh, you know, cats that that would look at this this podcast, man, I would say, you know, wanting to be a bodyguard, it, it's it's some things that are great about it, but it's a lot of shit that's that's um uh, hectic that comes with it because if you make certain moves like I said that could end somebody's life you got to live with that shit man right you know what I mean and right. you know the older you know I'll be 46 next next week the, the older you get you start looking back in life and you don't like, age man. bro you do not age bro <laughs> nah, I feel that shit though but yeah man you just <laughs> like I still feel that ass woman from London like oh yeah so no, but, so 6'9 mm -hmm. how did that happen how you get with 6'9 uh, I had a buddy named Vian. Shout out to Vian. Um, Vian had called me and he was like, "Hey man, uh, one of my folks called me and said they need the uh, emergency security and they need like six guys." And he said, "Man, I think it's for six nine. And I said, "What?" And it was funny because you know prior to him saying that, you know when I would see doing TV, I'm like, "Man, it's a little rainbow hair color motherfucker. That's what the rap gang going on. These niggas got rainbow hair." So, um. I, uh, uh, when my boy told me about it, I was like, well, what is the pay? And he said, uh, it's, it's 350 a day and they need six guys. And he's like, man, I'm, I'm about 90, 95% sure at six, nine. Cause, uh, I guess at that time, six, nine had, had fired the, the prior, uh, security squad he had with him. And so, um, I said, okay, cool. I said, man, we'll find out for sure. And then if it is, you know, I'll rock with you. And so, uh, we put together, it was uh, my boy, like I said, Beyonce, me, Big Church, and then uh, I called my dude Tori and Big Marco, and uh, like, I'm 6'7", Church 7'1", Tori 6'8", Marco another 7-footer, and then we had the homie out of uh, out of uh, Tampa, Big Arms, shout out to Arms, uh, Big Swole dude, he, uh, OG cat, about 6'5", good, good, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, good brother, um, so it was all, all of us, and so, um, uh, we met up with him in Chicago, and was it Chicago? No, we met met up with him in Houston, 
And uh, when he seen me in church, he recognized us. He was like, oh, man, y'all, that, that, that's uh, Mayweather's guys, right? And then he had, uh, 6 9 had a dude named uh, Crippy that worked with him. Mm -hmm. And um, ironically, uh, Crippy and his, and his folks uh, used to be with 50. And so uh, they had a little incident some years prior that Crippy had recognized Big Church. And so we was all sitting down and uh, uh, talking, you know, we just put, you know, things together and stuff like that. And then we were just all, we all became real cool. And so uh, Crippy had told us that, you know, uh, 6 9 had wanted us two to, to, to permanently be with him and stuff like that. And so, like I was saying before, when I'm around any client, usually I end up being the, the, the head of security because they just know how, they like how I move. Cause like I like to drive what whoever I'm working for because I know how to drive and I know if we get into any situation I'm gonna get us out of that situation, and the way that I conduct my security as a, as a, just just as a as a man as a business you know I know how to move people safely from here and here and there, and then knowing that we were gonna be in L.A. a lot and you know since I found out I was from South Central he was, I guess he looked at it like this. That's an asset. Know. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, an yeah. asset to have somebody who really from the shit that, you know, if I'm here on the West Coast, I can I can move a little better and shit like that. So, um, you know, six six nine man Daniel, Daniel was a was a the the the, the, the young man. He was a, a a a good kid, man. He just had a lot of shit around him, a lot of people around him that that put him in, you know, stirred him in in the, in the directions that he didn't need to be going in. So what were, what were the things you were telling? Basically, I remember <laughs> vividly, man, um, the night that uh, him and uh, Kanye was filming a video in Beverly Hills at this big old mansion, and Nicki Minaj was supposed to come to a song they did. Um, and that, that video shit, the video set got shot up. And uh, um, l later on that evening, we were in the car, and I was like, dude, you you can't fuck around in, in the L.A. man on some gang shit. I said, dog, this is where the shit started at. I said, and you know, you saying you a blood, you this, that, and the third. You know, ain't 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 no dissing to what, what what you what you saying you are. But I said, on on the West Coast, man, it's just all that shit is just viewed totally different, man. These dudes is is hot at you, man, and not you know you need to. You got to chill, man. I said, because you got to think about it like this. Tupac and Biggie, two of the greatest rappers of all time, both lost their life on some West Coast shit. You know what I mean? And that's just is what it is. Biggie was my favorite rapper. But unfortunately, man, where we come from, me being from South Central Los Angeles, man, it just, it's, it's just a different code in the city. And I'm not making it right. I'm not making it wrong. I'm just like you have to know, be aware, of the, aware, aware of your surroundings and what you're doing and how you carry yourself. And uh, when you claim in certain things that that people have lost their lives for or they lost their loved ones for, they take what you're doing to offense if you're really not from that. And so right. I was like, dude, you've been blessed with a position to provide for yourself and your family and stuff like that. I focus on your music, man. Leave that gang shit alone. What was his reply to that? And he'd be like, man, I hear you, man. I, I hear you. I hear you, big homie. I hear you. You know what I mean? He, ne he never was on some, oh, nigga, you can't tell me shit. He, ne he never was like that with me, man. He always, every time I would talk to him, he would listen. And I was just hoping that, you know, he would take it, uh, heed that advice I was giving him. So, um, you know, uh, um, unfortunately, you know, everybody see the, the, the shit that had happened with him because right before he got caught up with all the stuff, the, the, the jail stuff, we were supposed to go back to New York with him. And uh, he was set to go on like a two year tour. And man, we was excited. Like, man, we're going to get this money. It's, it's going to be cool. And then all this shit just came down on him. And so, so that just kind of messed everything up. I seen him, online, like he, his vehicles was tapped. Did anything like, like federal come your way? Like as no. far as FBI and all that, because no. I've seen stuff in like in the the, the, the tabloids and uh, six nine bodyguards. Blah, 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 blah. Now, yeah, but that you know that all all that stuff was was uh, like guys who had did shit with him in New York, 
and uh, uh, things like that nature, things of that nature. You know, we never, we never did nothing illegal with, with him or for him. And, uh, you know, I think it was totally professional. So we, when we were doing security, we already had our thing structured. So, you know, he couldn't put us in no bad, bad spot because we wouldn't allow ourselves to get there. Right. Would you, you know, do sec- would you do security for him again if he called? No. Nah. Mm-hmm. Because one thing about me now is that, uh, like I stated earlier, being that um, you know I'm about to be 46, man. I, you know I'm I'm a, I'm a grown, grown man, especially in this in this industry. And my services have to be paid for, and the caliber of people that I've worked for outside of the celebrities, you know, I've worked for actual billionaires, would it be that were in Forbes, <laughs> and people who have paid me like some great money. I've made money in Las Vegas that people wouldn't even believe unless I showed them mm. that a, a person could make it private security. So when when whenever like people follow, who follow me, make sure you follow me at Mr. Adam Plant on, on uh, so Instagram. So at the bottom of the screen, make sure you follow that. <laughs> Most people who follow me, if you see me put, I'm doing private security, just know uh, that person is paying me some money. You know what I mean? Now, if I use the term bodyguard, that usually applies to a celebrity because the celebrities most times not going to pay with the gamblers and, and the big people pay. When I say big, <clears throat> big people, I'm talking about big, big money people. And usually like, like a thousand a day or better. That's, that's, pr- I, I provide private security for them. Bodyguard is like, you know, uh, <laughs> five, 600, you know, which, which is still cool, buddy. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, in Las Vegas, it will blow your mind the money you can make if you are a person of Didn't my Vegas mind. try to stop black people from doing like you know private security? Yeah, well, they had an incident, um, a couple of incidents that some guys had had that uh, led to uh, uh, one young lady getting hurt, and on a separate occasion, some more people getting hurt, whatever. So they sued the club, they sued the hotel. And so the hotel and the clubs, you know, came down and uh, got with this or, um, this organization called the Private Investigators Licensing Board, and they told them they didn't want anybody, any guys in their clubs doing uh, bodyguard and executive executive protection that were that were not licensed. And so, you know, they hit me with that rule too, and I, I felt offended because I was like, man, I've been doing security in Vegas since two thousand one. So how y'all gonna tell me that shit? So when they were sending me notices like you need to get licensed, you need to get licensed, I was just disregarding. I was balling the paper up, you know, Kobe, <laughs> <laughs> throwing my shit away. Like this don't apply to me. And boy, was I wrong because I didn't know that these people was looking at my Instagram. And you know, I like to post me with clients, not as a bragging thing or anything like that. But when I post things with clients, it's just to attract other clients. Because when people say, "Oh, look, look how you take care of this guy," you know, he set the club up, set the you know the uh, the the uh, party bus or whatever it is, and it, this guy knows what we're doing. So we need to. That's what we need to get. So that's why I will post things on my Instagram. And so uh, uh, I had posted one time. Uh, it was January tenth, two thousand nineteen. Memory is crazy. <laughs> and I had posted. I said, "Man, this should be a good night." My one of my biggest clients coming in. We're going to see Drake. He got the biggest table at uh, Access. Little did I know that the guys from the PIL B board were watching that. And so they had sent me like four notices to to go get licensed. Like I said, I crumbled them up and, sh- and threw them away. So I guess after they send you three notices, if you don't respond, they can arrest you. And so, by, yeah, by me posting that, um, I remember vividly, man, I was coming. I got the client. It was me and the other three of my guys walking downstairs. And so we came downstairs. I seen like, you know, I seen uh, – uh, a lot of people from rap a lot. I seen uh, Drake was down in the lobby. This is the Encore Tower Suites. A lot of a lot of big name people. They, you know, everybody was with Drake, and so I seen also like twenty cops in the green uniforms, like little jumpsuits they be wearing. And I'm like, damn, who the fuck they here? They 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 here to get. And so um, <laughs> little did I know, they was there to get Adam Plant. So you know, we walked I walked the client out, and we're heading over to Excess. And so the director of security for uh, the win and Encore and then two other cops, two or three cops, they all approached me. I'm like, damn, what the hell is this about? 
And they were like, Adam Plant? I said, yeah. They said, uh, uh, sir, do you have any weapons on you? I said, no. I said, I have three CCW licenses, though. I can carry weapons. I said, but I didn't bring no weapons on your, on your uh, premises. And they said, well, you mind we talk to you for a minute? Just, it'll be real quick. I said, no, nah, no problem. So I had my guy. I said, y'all, y'all walk my client to the club. So I went to the back. And one dude was like, uh, place your hand on top of your head. You've been arrested for unlicensed activity. I'm like, what the fuck is unlicensed activity? You know what I'm saying? And so... Uh, um, basically it was, like I said, they had sent me notices to get licensed. I, I disregarded the notices. And so they felt like I was blatantly disrespecting them. So they was like, the only way we can stop to do, we got to arrest them. So they arrested me and took my, um, my, uh, work card. Cause I did have a, uh, uh, work card at the time. So they took that and, uh, um, you know, I couldn't work for like a year legally. And then, you know, it, it, but it was good for me in a way because it made me get all my paperwork right. So now I'm licensed, and in Las Vegas, I want I want to you know all the guys that's gonna watch this. I want to I want to make this very very clear. If you do private security in Las Vegas and you're not licensed, and they catch you and they give you a, uh, uh, they send you a um, what do you call that a citation. If you do not pay attention to that citation and you disregard it, after your third one, they will arrest your ass and they will come get you. I mean, they like, uh, uh, I never had to pay child support, but what I've heard from child support, they like that. They'll come wherever you are and come get your ass. What? You know, when they ain't playing. Because, I mean, it, it, Vegas is about money, man. And they, you got you to know. pay for the license, let me get. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not the, the actual, if you if you want to start a company and do a license, probably like a couple of, couple of thousand, but... You the thing that's good about it, you can work for a licensed company. Now you can do work under a licensed company. So now I currently, whenever I do bodyguard work, uh, my boy Bill he owns Bulwark Security, so I pay him a fee whenever I do security and uh, to cover me, so I could work under his license. Uh, so so okay, I'm covered. That's dope. That's dope. Yeah yeah. So I'm you know I pay a little uh, little little fee every time I, I have one of my clients. Yeah you know I'll uh, send that to him. And then, uh, um, you know, I work under his license, so I'm good. And then I got, all, you know, my my work cards. You know, I just made sure that I'm up on all of my shits because I'm just a person that I never like to be told shit. And, I'm, uh, and I don't like, you you know, people fucking with me for unnecessary reasons. So I just try to always stay a step ahead of the game so you never have to try to catch me slipping. Right, right, so right. So I would advise all the youngsters, man. Get yeah, y'all come to Vegas. They better listen to you. You're just the OG, come, man. Come to Vegas. Go to the private investigator licensing board. Go get your, uh, it's called a, um, what do you call it? a PILB work card and uh, make sure you're working under a licensed company. Because, you know, a lot of guys, and I, and I guess I'm, I'm part of the blame for this too, when I was doing securities with Floyd and different people, you know, me putting that on Instagram to, to some eyes looking from the outside in, that looks intriguing to them like I'm bragging or, man, big Adam doing it. I want to do that shit. I want to get on private jets. I want to get on that, do that, just that and the third. And yeah, 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 that looks like the life. And then they think they're gonna come in and make the money that I'm making. And bullshit, nah, it don't work like that. Sure you got don't. to pay your dues. You know what I'm saying? Everybody get on the turntable ain't gonna be a J Bling. You know what exactly. I'm saying? Exactly. <laughs> but show <sure> ain't. <laughs> yeah, it don't be me, man. You dig? So and that's the same thing. They work in security, man. You could see my lifestyle and the people who I've worked for and what I've done, but you're not me. I am the only me, you know what I mean? And I became him because I never copied nobody else. I never wanted to be like nobody else. I wanted to formulate my own style. And I looked at different things that different bodyguards did. And from that, I just, you know, okay, I see him doing that, doing this that way. I might not want to do it that way. I'm going to take it and flip it like this. So I kept just learning and learning and learning in the security game until I formulated who I am in this game, and that's one of the best bodyguards of all time. Can't nobody doubt that. When you put my visual resume up, you got to say, gosh, damn. Facts, facts. <laughs> You know, so, that's real. So I know real. you've been hearing about, I want to ask you, so so you've been hearing about a lot of the, the, the robberies going on mm-hmm. here in L.A. What's your take on that? And, and my question to you is, if I wanted to become armed mm-hmm. here in L.A., would I be able to get a CCW or? Well, um, with with uh, California getting the CCW is is kind of like uh, what it is. It's a who you know thing because some guys who know different sheriffs, know different uh, policemen that can you know get them 
that that hookup. But what I would tell people, there's a guy out here named Glenn Davis who I actually have my uh, exposed weapon license through. He's the guy that you know you you would go. You, you should go to, he's out of, uh, he has an office in Compton. He has one in uh, Hollywood, Glenn Davis. And he's on Instagram, uh, Glenn Davis. Um, he can get you set up with at least an exposed weapon license, meaning like, uh, you know, if you were doing security, you can carry, but you have to have your badge showing somewhere on your body, but you you can carry. Now, for people who are not in the security and who just want to get a, a, a gun license, which I highly suggest, um, you can probably, you know, take in a gun class at a gun store somewhere. And in those stores, you, they'll have people that can instruct you on, you know, properly going about the, the way of getting a, a license to carry. Because with these with these cats that's doing all these robberies, what they're, what they're going to make happen is that they're going to make these laws easier for people to carry guns. And it's about to be a whole lot of, Guys who thought they were about to do wrong, that's gonna be getting their ass blowed off, you know, their heads blowed off and shit like that. Because, you know, I feel I feel that everybody should be able to carry. Right. Real talk. Right. That's one of the things I love about the state of Texas. It's an open carry and Nevada. It's so easy to get a, a gun license. And and in Texas now, you don't even have to have a gun license. Everybody can carry. You can carry, man. And I think everybody should be able to carry, man. Because if people know that you got a gun. They got a gun, but you know they you you got a gun. Now they're taking a chance on their life, and I think that common sense wise, even though sometimes sometimes you know people when they in a certain mindset, they don't give a fuck about what they're doing, and they're just gonna go anyway because they're gonna be like, well, fuck it, he got a gun, but they ain't, the motherfucker ain't gonna use what I'm using. All right, remember a twenty two can tear your heart out if it's shot by the right person. Right, you know what I'm saying. So right. if you think because I got an AK, I got something bigger that. I'm going to have more of an advantage of, of getting getting at somebody than they're going to have over me if they got a smaller gun. You a fucking fool, especially if it's, especially if it's somebody who trains to shoot. You could take a deuce deuce and and knock anybody off if you know how to shoot. So, I think that you know with all the crime uh, getting bigger, well becoming be, becoming a, a bigger problem, that eventually they're going to make it easier for everybody to carry. And then once that happens, it's shit. Hey, like I tell they, people, especially in Vegas, man, you know, and and I'm not like to want to say like I'm invincible or I can't get God or every, everybody, anybody can get it at any time. I always remember that. Yeah. But I'm always carrying, always. When I come to Cali, I'm always carry, even gotcha. though, you know, you know, like I said, I got exposed weapons license here. But I, I I keep at least four guns in my truck at all time, man, because I'm not gonna play play, man. I'd rather you go home in a body bag than me. This Real is talk. True. This is true. I got a wife and I got kids, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do everything I can to protect myself and protect them. So and 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 I train to shoot. I'm a trained shooter. You know, I'm gonna go, I go to the range a lot. So, uh, you know, what to, to answer your question, man? I just it's going to get to the point where they're gonna allow people to start carrying. And you know, I would tell people even with a lot without a license, man. And and you know, you have to you have to gauge just to what fits you in your life. I'll just say, don't be no damn fool. If you are living in a neighborhood where you know that it's it's kind of fishy and shit could happen, I was, carry, man, carry. Right. Because right. right. you you know, and it's like you know, with you, like you're you're doing deliveries and mm-hmm. you're dealing with like you know transactions and stuff. You <laughs> so everybody know. Jay, while we on this podcast, if you ever think Adam ain't caring while I'm delivering, you was a damn fool. Right. Always know I got them tools on me. Just taste the cheese, <laughs> but anybody got yeah. taste the cheese. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, you know, with my transactions, most people, uh, you know, uh, that's what that's why I have people pay me through the through the, the, the cash the, app, the cash all. app, and the Zelle and shit like that. Because I don't really like dealing with cash like that. But I ain't no damn fool. You right. know what I mean? I always got that tool on me. Always, so right, right. you know that so, is. What it so, so with Tasty Tea, speaking of, of Tasty Tea, mm-hmm. art the support you getting support from everybody. Like, like, I well, okay. So when when we use that term support, I look at it like this, and it don't nobody don't nobody you know get me wrong when I say this. When we support certain items, certain products. 
in a lot of cases, support come because, you know, we say you black, I'm black, support it. And in, in, in some instances, I've learned that people who are supplying whatever product that it is, they'll use that as a crutch to not give you the quality. And they say, you know, you support me because I'm black, you black. I don't have to be a, a A plus quality provider. Just support it because we got the same skin color. I, I don't I don't go by that that logic, yeah. nor does my wife. We're asking you to buy our product because it is the best of its kind. Okay. When when you just just look at it like this, especially people who are in business and just any any human being that's that that has common sense. Folks, in any business, if you have a product that all people of no matter what background they are, no matter what age group they are, if everybody who instantaneously bites it initially from the first bite and they all say it's the best of its kind in any product that anyone has. Everybody would dream to have something like that. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Have, have you ever like, had any companies try to come come buy it? Not, not as of yet. I, we've, you know, I get a lot of people who, who hit me about doing collaborations and this like that. And I want people to know, we will never collab with anybody. We don't have to. Our product is like, and I know it's kind of hard for people to really uh, uh, fathom. It's hard for them to really put this in the head like, that dude was a bodyguard. How in the fuck did he he got, is the co owner of the best cheesecake in the world? How the hell did that happen? Right. It happened, y'all. It happened. <laughs> you know what I, I got a crazy story for you with the cheesecake too. Okay. Oh, before I forget, mm-hmm. so I, I I know this girl and she was lactose, right? Mm-hmm. And she was and I had some cheesecake mm-hmm. and she kept looking at everybody review, review it. She still tried it. And she is like, I can't be eating this. And she kept going back, kept going back, kept going. Hey. I was like, yo, it really made you do that? She was like, look, I've never, I, I don't know, I couldn't stop. I'm like, wow. I've had, we've and had like, By people. the way, mm-hmm. if you're listening to this, y'all, I promise you, it is no cap. I promise, <laughs> I promise, try these cheesecakes. Everybody's reaction is genuinely well, like I the said, same. man, you can't. That is something that you can't front on, man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, a, a woman can fake her reaction when she with a man. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, you know, but no, nah, you can't do that with food, man. Because y'all gotta understand, we I post videos with everybody from babies to toddlers to young kids to teenagers to young adults to middle age to. Uh, 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 a little older crowd to the seniors. Everybody say, I'm talking about black folks, white folks, Latinos, Samoans, Asians, no matter, it, just humans. You just got to be a person. <laughs> I even had a couple of doggies that was <laughs> just trying to get, get at their people to get to, to uh, get, get some of it, man. But all people say the same thing. And they say that from the first bite. Like, damn, we have never tasted nothing like this. And I, you know, let that soak in your mind, folks. If you could see something visually, it got to go to the receptors in your brain. Like, I, I'm looking at what I'm looking at. It reminded me of when that guy was like, oh, Patty. Patty LaBelle. You got these right, patties. right. It, it, it remind, and that reaction made the mm. world say, I got to try these. And that's, I see that when same. When you start singing when he ate the Pat the Bell. Yeah. yeah, right, right, I right. I see the same thing with, with the cheesecake. It's like Man. the reaction just makes you say, all right, let me try this. That, and, and and that's what, what I brought to the table, like I mentioned earlier. That's what, what makes me and my wife such a great team is that my wife is the only person that know how to make this. Me and her are the only one that even know the recipe, right? And that's because it's something that we created. And when I say we, she always has been the maker, but... It was always like, babe, taste this, taste this. What you doing? Which thing? Which thing? Taste this, taste this. And then one day she hit me, taste this. I said, babe, bam, that's it. Don't do nothing else. That that is it. Because I was like, <laughs> shit. When I ate it, like, fuck. It, it just it, man. When I tell you, when you bite into that thing, man, it just it just move you. It's like a, a lady earlier had said, um, 
it was soothing to her soul. And and it's like that, man. It's like some soul wrenching. It's made with love. It it is, man. Like my wife really, you know, loves this, man. For years, you know, she was trying to find her niche of what she wanted to do. And then when we decided to make this a business, it was just like, like I said, she had already been making these, but it wasn't a business yet. But like every holiday when she would make them, all of her nieces and nephews, everybody in the family were like, damn, auntie, D, oh my gosh. Like we need to put this, you need to put that out. And so, but we, you know, we hear that and we wasn't moving on it, mainly my fault. Cause I, like I said, I was doing security. But once I had got off the road with Sweetie, man, and, and decided, babe, we, this is what we're gonna do. My, my my passion for it is so great because this is like Tasty T is like my fourth child. You know what I mean? Right. I look at this like this is my this is our baby. You know what I mean? We own this shit. Like when I see this label, my boy Justin, he, shout out to Justin. He he uh we told him what we was looking for, and you know, he brainstormed and then he hit us with that. He said, How y'all like this? We was like, bam, that's it. So this this is our shit, man. We own this. And uh the thing that that makes us so prideful in it is that when when people can look at this black man and this black woman that's married, you know, they came together and put the best of their talents, with some of the best of their talents together. And their talents went together so well. They complemented each other so well that they just formed the ultimate team. And that team produced the best taste in cheesecake. And now, I, like I said before, I know it's hard for people to... to fathom that it came from a bodyguard because that, they only see me in one light but you got to open your mind up you see me in one light i never seen myself in that just that bodyguard right. feel i always knew it was something greater i wanted to do now i can't to be honest i can't say that it was gonna be cheesecake i, I didn't know it was gonna be that you know what i'm saying it's like on ghostbusters when the lady doing that the, the, the chick told him to choose the form of the destructor and right. dude was like it just popped in my head to stay puff marshmallow man <laughs> <laughs> like of all the destruction destructors you chose, you chose the stay puff nigga. What the fuck? <laughs> but it's like it's, I I never knew it was gonna come in the form of a cheesecake or claim to fame, but it did. And so, you know, uh, being that it's here now, it's uh the, the passion for it that I have is so great. Like if somebody call our shit tasty cakes, I get pissed the fuck off. Like dude, our shit ain't tasty cakes. It's tasty teas. Cheesecake. It stands for Tasty Tamika's Cheesecake. That's what it stands for. It seemed like that so. name would be like in an Ice Cube movie. <laughs> yeah. like, like everybody going hey, on. Tasty it, tea. Give <laughs> some tasty teas, man. For us, it's one of them. Yeah. It, just, it, just, it just fit. It gives me that Roscoe's this brand oh, name man. feel. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and the, the thing, too, with it, man, is we want to do business different. And um, in the business world, there are products that people, it makes sense for them to have partners with, right? But for us, it no, nah, we don't Family. need no partners, man. It, our product speaks for itself. Like I just stated, if you have any product and you have all people saying it's the best of its kind, you, that, then the product speaks for itself. At that point, you just need to open your spot up, which we're in, in, pro, in, in you know, striving to do, open our first spot up. Once we get our first, um, Bakery, restaurant, store, however you want to classify. Once we get that up, the first one, and we know what the model is, how we want to have it from that point on, and we open these things up in every major city, y'all looking at a billionaire. I'm just, there's no other way to put it I because we already know what the demand is. It's like when Krispy Kreme donuts hit, and everybody knew, yeah, you had Winchell's, yeah, you had Yum Yum's, you had, you know, whatever little mom and pop spots, but that Krispy Kreme hit. And it was like, oh, we. So right. now, you know, you got Junior's Cheesecakes. You got Eli's Cheesecakes in Chicago. You got Cheesecake Factory. I'm here to say that according to all people, we taste way better than all three of them people. And, and that's no diss to them companies because we, me and my wife, we respect those companies because as we got into the cheesecake business, we wanted, we had to study and see who were the cheesecake leaders. And Junior's is, a, you know, well-respected, world-renowned, known cheesecake company, as is Eli's in Chicago, as is the Cheesecake Factory. We go to the Cheesecake Factory to eat the food. We like the food, but, you know, we don't eat the cheesecake. But we, I've tried the cheesecake. <laughs> there, and Cheesecake Factory has a good cheesecake, don't get me wrong, yeah. but we got the best. 
when it when it comes to the word cheesecake, I tell people like this: if you, you know, a lot of people are like, oh well, is your cheesecake a New York style? Or like, no, no, we are tasty teas cheesecake style. We this this is what a cheesecake was supposed to taste like. If you didn't have this prior to eating ours, God bless you. Come home, bring the taste buds to where they belong. Because we can back up everything we say. Like I said once again, it is impossible for all people to say from the initial taste that this is the best cheesecake they've ever had if it wasn't true. Because I ain't paid nobody. I ain't asked nobody, man, please, hey, man, please say this. Hell no. That's why when Man, I go to people, I've job. never, I never. Think, I think you need to say that. I ain't never had nobody never just please say it's dope. To this day and 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 for forevermore, there has never been a person paid to say that the cheese case was good. Never been a person paid to say, uh, uh, man, just, just get a couple of words. No, no. That's why these Tasty Teas testimonials are so authentic because I like to get the first reaction of people. I'll put it in and front of you heard and first. I know what you're going to say. Now that's confidence, y'all. Like I always say, you have to be that assured in your product to know that what you put in front of people, the people are going to say it is the best of their kind. If your shit ain't the best, you cannot do that. And it's on the screen right now. We're going to make sure you guys look and check it out. If you if you guys are watching it, go this follow is, the this page, man. This is it right here. Yeah. Put up, put up, put up, put up. The best cheesecake ever, Tasty Teas. Make you smile like these. Yeah, so so all the support you got from mm-hmm. from, from, from Tasty Teas, uh, one person in general, Diddy. Yeah. That's cheesecake from making a <laughs> band, you know what I'm saying? He tried yeah. it. I, what, what was his response to you? Well, no. So he still haven't tried it yet. Oh, he just reposted. He just he just posted. You know, I had uh, I had uh, sent him uh, uh, the uh, menu, and he put it on on his story. Damn. And uh, you know, I mean, try. hey man, for some for Diddy to do anything like that, especially for free, you know, that's 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 a, a blessing for, for a marketing standpoint. But uh, you know, Shaq he did a video for me and. Um, he also did a, a post on his page. Snoop did a post when we first came out. And, you know, he was like, I want to give a shout out to my my homeboy, Adam Planter's wife with Tasty Teas. And, you know, he was like, I don't eat cheesecake, but everybody said it was the best damn cheesecake they had. But then he had uh, called me and asked me to bring down, um, uh, my wife made 24 dozen, so a dozen of each flavor. And I bought it to him and uh, he finally did eat some. And he was like, man, I don't even eat cheesecake, but dog, this shit here. <laughs> it's, it's the best and uh, like I tell people man even if you know you lactose you, you're intolerant or you don't you say you don't eat cheesecake you don't eat dairy you don't this, eat, do this that and the third tasty teas is going to change you yeah, it's gonna change your mind, man. Lavar Ball. So. Oh, 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 yeah, Lavar, and you know every, every, everybody. Well, if you don't know that about me, me and Lavar played football with each other at Long Beach City College, nineteen ninety three. So you know, I was an offensive tackle. He was a tight end. So Lavar was always like a big brother figure to me, and um, just a just a real dude. So no matter um, you know how much money he got and and, and the success he's got, we've always had that brother brotherly relationship, man. So uh, you know. Um, he had reached out and it was like, uh, "Big Adam, I, I need. I'm seeing what everybody's saying with these cheesecakes, man. I need, I need to, I need to see what they're talking about." So, you know, as you, you know, anybody who's seen the video, I brought him down, and um, you know, he just went crazy about him, man. And uh, like I say, the the thing that's so great about what we doing with our cheesecakes is we really showing people that, yo, we 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 all the same when it comes to food, man. I don't care how much money you got, where you live, what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in. When at the end of the day, <laughs> when them cheesecakes hit the road, it could be Jay Z, Beyonce, P Diddy, me, Bling, Lavar, Fred Sanford, <laughs> Elvis Presley, Sammy Davis Jr. We all gonna say the same damn thing. Gosh damn, that's what we're gonna say when we eat these cheesecakes, man. It's a people thing, man. It's it's like 
your 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 uh, social status has nothing to do with your desire of wanting a good food. Just like you could be in the high rise of somebody on the street. If I give both, if I give cheesecake to both people, they gonna have the same reaction. Now with success, mm-hmm. you know it comes hate, right? Oh yeah. How do you handle the hate? Have you have you encountered that and certain people that <laughs> that hated it on it? Were you surprised and shocked? Yeah, certain, by it? yeah, certain people, man, because you know there there are people who could actually if they if they wanted to see me win right now they there are several individuals. Uh, well, shit, more than several. There are there are shit at least probably about fifty people that I know who are all millionaires and billionaires that if they wanted to see this really happen. Like yesterday, they can say, "Hey man, look, look I'm gonna front you this meal. When y'all get that that meal, give me give me a meal and a half back, mm. which would be cool." Like they, I'm talking about people who I know got it, got it. But I'm like this. I'm my own man. Have they tried it? Have they tried it? The people? Man, everybody that know me, if you ain't tried it, it's just cause they hate to see what's happening. If that's real talk. If you know me and you ain't tried Tasty Cheesecake, I got a couple people that I grew up in Rialto with. I'm from South Central Los Angeles, but first to ninth grade, I grew up in Rialto. And it's just funny. Like, it's a couple people I re- reached out to that, that have known me since, like, elementary and junior high school. But because they see this happening, and it's Adam Plant, they ain't like, nah. I, 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 re- I remember uh, 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 a couple weeks ago, I reached out to one of the so-called homies, like, hey, man, you want to try this? Oh no, man, I'm I'm good, man. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't really fool no cheesecake. I said, man, even though you see what everybody's saying, it still ain't gonna change your mind. No, man, you know, I'll, 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 that ain't what I do. Okay, cool. I ain't gonna force it on you. But like, like you say, hey, it's like you telling me you hating on me without even telling me, and it, and it's it's um that's one of the unfortunate things in life because um we all have unless you know it's it's a, it's a uh, medical condition or something like that. We all have the same 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 or in a leap year, 366 days. We all got that. We all have that. If what you were doing with your 24, 7, 365 did not give you the results that what I was doing in my 24, 7, 365, 65, you can't hate on that. Why would you be mad at that? Right. Right. You got the same ability mentally, unless you have something physically wrong with you, that you could take time to come up and create something that could work for you. I think it's your confidence that people people don't like because you're so confident. And it's the same thing with LeVar Ball and his mm-hmm. sons playing, you know, playing basketball. He was so confident behind them that people hated it. Yeah, well, well, hate stems from a couple of things. One of the things is jealousy. Another thing is fear. People are fearful of going at, a lot of people are fearful of going after their goals. They're feel fearful of, of putting in the work that it takes or they just lazy and they don't want to do it. They just want an instant, um, uh, an instant reward without putting in that grind. And that ain't how life worked. Very few of us was born that somebody who came before us thought about let me build up a nest a nest egg for the people who come after me. Very few of us have that situation. Most of us are born into something where our parents were struggling. We didn't have the parents that we desired to have as far as parents who could who who built that for us, that that safety net. A lot of us didn't have that. I love my mom and daddy to death, but their aspirations in life was never what mine is. My dad told me learn a trade and just get a job. Hell nah. <laughs> don't get me wrong if you if you're working a nine to five I want and I want really want to push this if you're working a nine to five but you're also at the same time taking steps towards building something for yourself that is perfectly fine because like I said we're not most of us are not born into a situation where we could just say hey I'm gonna become a business owner I'm gonna create and and I'm gonna do that today because I got the money nah a lot of us have to work for that shit you know what I'm saying so there's nothing wrong with punching a time clock if it's in efforts to constantly build something for yourself. But you have to realize that most people who became successful took that leap of faith and they took that initiative and they were self-motivated people. Since I've been a kid, I've always been told what I can't do. Mm. And what people didn't realize what that did is that word can't 
I turned that into I'm going to. So whether you were supporting me in a positive way or whether you were telling me what I can't do, either way, when it hit my receptors, it was <laughs> shit. You just charged me up a thousand right. more times. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you was playing Pac-Man and you were down your last man, they ate that, but it, it, that, it, that word can't come up. You got a thousand more men. That's what they did to me. So yeah. my motivation and my self-drive is something that I always say, the devil can't even stop. Even if they shot me and killed my, my body, my energy would, 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 would go on. You know what I mean? And um, um, I, I'm not going to be stopped, man. I'm not. And uh, uh, when, I, when I say that, not, not in a, a sarcastic way, it's my, my drive for wanting to be great. Like when I tell people we're going to be billionaires, I, I didn't skip past the millions. The only reason why me and Tamika Plant ain't got a billion dollars because we don't have at least 40 stores right now. If we had at least 40 bakeries up right now, we'd be, I think we'd be in the billions because the demand for this will be so great. Once most people, it's like, okay, look at it like this. We, you know, I like doing numbers. It's over 300 million people in the United States, okay? Over 300 million. Uh, I think when I did the calculations, if 20 billion people, excuse me, if 20 million people, 20 million bought one dozen of Tasty Tea's Cheesecakes at $50 a dozen, I think that's, when I did the calculations, it was $1.9 billion. That's off of 20 million people, and there's over 300. So that means one-twelfth, okay? <laughs> so if you take 20 million out of 300 million, that's one-twelfth, you know, you do your math. If one-twelfth of America bought one dozen of Tasty Tea's Cheesecake, which is $50, me and Tamika Plant have $1.9 billion already. Then you got the repeat buyers. Now, exactly. So if you take $100 million, we'd have, shit, a little over $6 million. Because if you say $1.9, that's almost two. So that we'd have almost $10 billion off of 100 million people buying a $50 dozen. Man, that's I, deep. I, I, I mean, think about it. That's deep. Fifty dollars ain't is a lot to some people, but in America, uh, you know, a lot of people can get fifty dollars. Fifty, fifty dollars. It's crazy because your, your, your energy it seems like everything's falling in place. I see your son; he was uh, he was uh, playing college in Texas. Now he's back. Yeah, in the you know, valley, close to home, doing you know, doing his thing. Shout out to all three of my babies. My my, my yeah, oldest, yeah, Ajane. She she's, 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 she's in college. Yeah, my my oldest daughter. She's working on the masters now. Yeah, she's she's working on the master. I mean, working on masters. Master, I'm working on her your masters. Your youngest daughter. I see you posted. She can choose any college she wants. Academically. To go. Academically, full ride. Right? Full ride. My oh baby my going God. out. My baby going on academics, y'all. And she's narrowed it down to USC, UC Berkeley, and. Uh, well, another one of the UCs, but she has her choice because she has like a four point five, and then uh, as, er, everybody who you know follows me always see my son Adam Plant Jr. number seven for UNLV. He's doing his thing, and he decided to come back for a senior year, so he's he's gonna be playing uh, two thousand twenty two at UNLV. Watch out for him because uh, if he gets them numbers to where he needs to get them to, uh, and you know, God willing, twenty two thousand twenty three, he'll be in the NFL. So. Um, the, the, the reason that I knew our kids were going to have success is because, once again, the mother they have. My wife is just a hell of a woman. And, uh, you know, at one time she wanted to be a teacher and a nurse. So she combined the the um, the, the want, the, the motherhood of, of, of nurturing and education and just rolled that up and just shot it into each one of our children. And each one of them, you know, graduated with, with, you know, flying colors and they doing their thing. And so I knew what kind of parents we, me and her were. So it, to, for our children to have success, it's like, you know, sometimes people say you can speak things into existence. I'm not really a one to believe in that notion as far as, as far as this, I I'll say, I have, I'll speak a plan that I have, but I know the work that's going to come behind. I know the work that I'm going to do. I know the work that my wife is going to do. That's why uh, um, uh, I'm a realist. That's like, you know, when LeVar said he knew his sons was going to the, to the NBA because he know what he put into his sons. He got his sons up every morning training them since they was babies. 
He knew the work that he put in with his kids. So he expected them to have them results. So when the results came, it was like, this is what I've always been planning to do. I've so, been telling y'all. This ain't it, new to yeah, me. this ain't new to me. So it was like, if my son go to the NFL, I've been, that's what I expect him to do. My, son, my daughter get her master's degree and be successful whenever she does. I expected that. My younger daughter get into whatever you see she wants to and become successful with whatever she does. I expect that. I expect Tasty cheese. <laughs> Adam and Tamika Platt to be multi-billionaires off of this cheesecake. I expect that because I know what the work that goes behind it is. So when you just spoke on the confidence, it's it's a confidence in knowing the work and preparation that has been put into this product. It's the best. We're not giving you bullshit. We're giving you the best shit. So you can't help but to get it. Because whether you like me or hate me or whatever, you can't deny what you're tasting. This is true. You can't deny it. You can't. So. At all. At all. Yeah. Man, you know, <laughs> hey, uh, you know, Big A, Adam Plant, I appreciate you for coming through, bro. Yeah, like, man. You know, talk, drop so much knowledge, drop so much game. And, oh, and man. Your story is just amazing. It's very inspiring. Because they're all true. <laughs> it's, all, it's all true it's all true i've been here to see yeah, it myself man. you know and, yeah. and i definitely appreciate you coming through and 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 i do wish you you know the most success because one mm. not only do you appreciate it but it, it's it's worth it everything yeah. it, 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 no one's going to waste their time with you right rather if it comes from you know doing security mm -hmm. if it with the tasty teas or whatever it is you bring to the table it, right. it, 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 you're not no one's wasting their time. Right. They're not wasting right. their money. Mm -hmm. It's a full experience. You know how to treat people. Yes, sir. You know how to eat your, your, your customer first person. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's what matters. So, right. I, you know, hats off to that. And I really do. I really do um, want to say, you know, congratulations on everything. Thank man. you, my brother. And I, I, I appreciate you having me on the show, man. This is a great platform, man. And, um, you know, any any time that we get this opportunity to uh, come together and um you know just show the the world our, our talents and uh be able to deliver that to the people man it's a, it's a beautiful thing man and um i'm 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 going to leave off with this man and i want to address this especially to all my guys that do security fellas if you first get into the security game and you know you were an artist or you, whoever your client is as somebody who has taken you to different places that you've never seen and you're around people and that you've not accustomed to, you're doing, you know, you're around events and shit, shit like that, concerts, uh, restaurants, whatever it is, especially if you were a, a, a music artist or athlete, whatever. You know, I understand if that's new to you, I understand, enjoy it, okay? Enjoy, because, you know, it it is exciting to go see parts of the world that you've never seen. You know, as security, I've been to Iceland, I've been to, uh, New Zealand, Australia, now, you know, like I said, all over the world, you know, doing security. So I understand the the um, the love that one would have, especially if you get into the security game and the bodyguard game, the first from from, uh, you know, being your first time. So I understand that. But the thing I want to express to you guys is look out for yourself. The security game doesn't have no 401k. There's no pension plan. There's no social security in it. And at the end of the day, most people that you work for are going to use your resources. And, then when, and when you can't do your shit no more, they'll find somebody else to replace you, point blank. So with that being said, when you make your money, put something to the side that you can build something greater than just being security. Okay, and and if 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 security is your thing that you want to do for the rest of your life, that's that's fine. But work towards having your own company one day, and you hiring guys that you can send out where you don't have to work that hard no more. You know what I mean? And and to all people who have security, I want y'all to really change your mindset of how you view that man that's protecting your life and your family. A lot of y'all look at security is that from the standpoint of they should be uh, happy to be around you or that they're limited to only being a big body that's standing around doing something. That's total bullshit because at one time that's how motherfuckers thought about me. 
and they clearly see that I'm in a position now with God blessing as we keep growing that I could one day real talk. And this is my, this is one of my dreams. I want to have more money than everybody I ever worked with put together. Ooh. Everybody I work with work for put together real talk. And I want them to kick themselves in the ass when they say how successful the business that my wife and myself created. When I reached out for, when I reached out to them from the initial start of this and asked them if they wanted to be a part of it and they, they didn't want to be a part of it. So when they see the success of it, it's going, it's going to make them feel some kind of way. Cause they're going to be like, damn, this motherfucker really came and did what he said he was going to do. And they should know if you hired me to work for you, you saw a skill in me that lets you have me run your security. So why wouldn't I have a skill to build a business for myself and my family? You know what I'm saying? That'd be crazy. Right. I was good enough to protect your life, but I'm not good enough to be a billion dollar, billion dollar businessman. Come on now. Stop. So, um, you know, so I was talking to a, a fellow bodyguard of mine earlier and he was like, man, one of the things that, and I, I, I'm, I'm real serious about this when I say this, one of the things that I really always had admired about Suge Knight is it, that Suge was a bodyguard at first, but Suge wanted more and he seen I'm not going to just be here in no fucking security. I'm going to get in, learn this shit, and then I'm going to create my own shit. Man built a multi-million dollar company from being a bodyguard. And the time, the, the times that I've been able to talk to Suge, that's what we talked about. He was like, he told me out of his own mouth, he said, Adam, man, you know what? I, I respect you because you play football like me, and you always, you know, you, I, I see you with multiple people. You're always doing your thing. And he was like, dude, just don't settle for being security. Keep working to have your own shit. And hey, here I am, man. As I sit here in front of y'all with my own <laughs> label, we own this shit. This is our logo. Wait till y'all see them tasty tees, leather them jackets that me and uh, Tabika about to get. Ooh, wee. <laughs> but you know, as I sit here looking at this man and and, and being able to do, be on Bling's a uh, uh, podcast and just the way I'm able to articulate to the world, like. They probably think like, God damn, this dude, you know, he really sound intelligent because I am motherfucker. I mean, I am very intelligent. I was an office lineman that got hurt, that became security and used security to build and be a catapult to being a businessman. So if you don't get nothing else from Adam Plant, get that from me. Don't just be there to do security. Soak up everything that you learn from being in different environments and situations and build that. Build yourself physically, build yourself mentally so that you too can one day have your own shit. Mm. That's what I want to leave y'all with, man. Once Church. again, I Church. I want to thank my man Jay Blaine for having me on the show. I'm 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 very thankful, man. This is the <laughs> bomb ass podcast. This is one of the most exciting podcasts I ever did, man. Cause you know I like to hear myself talk anyway. But Blaine, <laughs> thank you again, man. Appreciate this shit was you, awesome. Out man, I, please have me back again, oh, man. Def- I, oh, for I, sure. I, we might have to start uh, the, 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 the uh, every the, time you come on a trip back. Check, you know, <laughs> we're going to start another trip, man, because this shit is cool, man. I just like li- you know listen to speakers and shit like that because I have real stories, man. So when people ask me questions, it's easy for me to just f- keep flowing with with uh, 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 dialogue because all my shit is real. I ain't made really up nothing. It's really it. happened. So it's easy for me to just you know flip the switch in my head and, and just pull out the pages of that actual date, time, and event that happened because it really happened. You know what I mean? So once again, everybody, please go follow the Tasty Teas Cheesecake Instagram page and Facebook. And I will just keep loading that thing up with content of Tasty Teas testimonials, new flavors. And don't just follow. Make, make sure you man, order. Order. Because you're going to please yourself. And you're going to deliver. I promise you you're going to deliver. I'm coming to you. And watch this thing just blossom. Blossom, blossom. Yes, Peace sir. and love. Thank you again, Jay. Peace.